the only thing you should focus on in the beginning is solving the problem and traction. Several startups where we're like, we're in the build phase for so long. And I'm like, wait, we could use the whole time to find customers. So I think day one, let's say like today, you have an idea and you have a problem you want to solve. The very next question is like, who's going to use this and how would I would get customers? And imagine you had a magic wand and it was built. This is your startup. It's now built. Okay, go ahead. Go sell it. Get users. What would you do? Welcome to the From Spaghetti to Growth podcast. I'm your host, Seema Alexander, president of Virgin AI, co-chair of DC Startup Week, and the creator of The Unique Method. In each episode, I have unfiltered conversations with successful founders, CEOs, and experts where we delve into their personal business journeys and strategies that took them from chaos to growth and everything in between. If you're an entrepreneur seeking strategies to take your business to the next level, incorporating the future of AI into your business and turning your spaghetti into growth, this is the podcast for you. Now let's start growing. Welcome to today's episode of the From Spaghetti to Growth podcast. My name is Seema Alexander. And I am really excited to have this guest on with us today. It's somebody I've been wanting to have for a long time. His name is Weil Ashuraf. Weil is what I consider a ecosystem builder, an innovator, serial entrepreneur, tech enthusiast, and somebody who really, I think, is really vested in the entrepreneurial community. And so, Weil, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me, and thanks for the super kind introduction. Of course. Uh, of appreciate course. it. The only reason I do that and it is because you own it and you earned it. So appreciate well, thank you. you. Yeah. So um, I actually am going to start off because it'll be great to hear from you. How did you get into this entrepreneurial journey? Like, where did that start for you? I think I was born with like some entrepreneur DNA for whatever reason. Uh, but it started because I got very interested in technology super early on. Like I'm talking days of Commodore 64, if your guests can even I love remember Commodore. that. I love Montezuma's Revenge. <laughs> okay, You're speaking, okay. I'm in a 70s baby, so I can appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so ever since then, I was fascinated. I'm like, wow, you can create things with that. And then the first time I actually tried to be an entrepreneur uh, was as a freshman in college in 1994. Okay. Building an e-commerce website. Nice. Uh, That's right when the rise of the internet. It was, yeah. but uh, you didn't have things like payment portals and everything was difficult. So it failed miserably. Okay. But I kept filling up since then. I, I've always had the bug. And that's always been driven by curiosity of like what's possible. And that's kind of like the promise of technology for me in entrepreneurship, like what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to get into your, so that was the original journey. You, how many, how many startups did you have before say, uh, right? Uh, probably did five, five startups before that. Five startups. So where did you come up with the ideas? Looking for problems. It, was, it always started with a problem someone had or a problem that we wanted to solve. In the early days, it was always a problem like that. I had personally maybe experienced or a problem I wanted to solve. So like in the very early days, uh, we had set up a startup to help uh, alleviate uh, water shortages in Africa and Asian countries mm. through like a drink deals, uh, through like a, during the days when Living Social and Groupon were like booming. Yeah. Uh, but that was because there was a problem that we wanted to see solved, and we thought we could be part of the solution. Okay. Have you always been into social impact, Wael? I think so. I just uh, kind of naturally lean that way, uh, having grown up between like the U.S. and the Middle East and a lot of international backgrounds. It's just kind of like uh, part of what I saw growing up. Okay. So you are the CEO of Rights. Yes. You are the CEO and co-founder of Unstuck Labs. Correct. And you're a uh, CEO and founder of a stealth AI company, which I'm really excited. To, I'll talk about all of it. So let's talk, start with Rights. Like, what is it? Um, where did the idea come from? Let's start there. So uh, in a nutshell, Rights basically helps people learn what their rights are and then advocate for themselves and connect with resources to help them. Okay. And the story to that is quite personal and also related to my college freshman year, okay. uh, which was the second week on campus in the dorms, I got arrested. And at the time, I didn't know my rights. I didn't even do anything. So I was like, okay, this is fine. And I made every mistake you could make. Mm. And that planted the seed. It was like, whoa, if you don't know your rights, it's as if you don't have any. 
And then forward, you know, 25 years later, here I am mid, I wasn't even entrepreneurship at the time. I was in mid banking career. Uh, and all the George Floyd started to happen and Philando Castile. And then I was like, hmm, maybe that, like, I can solve this now with technology. And that was kind of the seed of it. Uh, ended up spinning up a prototype over a weekend and then spending the next couple of months having, hitting my hundred interviews, which I always try to like to validate. And then from there, uh, we're like, okay, we think we have something. Let's try to get this funded and, and grow this. So I think anytime you're stopped by the cops is probably the scariest moment of your life because I feel like there are two times that I feel the most uncomfortable is either when that happens or when I'm in a doctor's office and they're giving me some news that I don't want to hear. The right? unknown, right? <laughs> I feel like you, you have no say, right? Yeah. And so, first of all, what a amazing sort of, so, again, social entrepreneurship, social impact. I, I feel like it's impact and profit, right? This is yep. not a nonprofit. Yes? Correct. Okay. I would do, do good by doing well or yeah. do well by doing good. Yeah, my hashtag is always impact and profit. Yeah. So it's very aligned to that. But let me let's go deeper into this because it's it's nice to have a a concept that you're like this is a problem right this is like people get stopped by police or this is a, you know obviously it's exacerbated over the years but getting somebody to actually use an app like that and you know and and use it for the reasons and the purpose yep. that you want them to like let's break it apart because the concept is there I think the concept is great it sounded like you did a lot of uh, interviews to validate. We did, but then what? How, how do you how do you get somebody to actually use it in the way that you are visioning? So that is the big challenge, and the elephant in the room was like, okay, you build this thing. It's like, if someone's being pulled over, are they even going to remember to pull this thing out, and when? And do they use it once and forget about it? So one, we hit that challenge very early on. We're like, it's partly an education piece and access piece. So we're like, who are the right people to use this app other than at a police stop specifically? And what we figured out is that going to the organizations mm -hmm. that are already helping the tens of thousands or more people and giving them this tool to help their uh, people they advocate for was much more powerful than just depending on like one-off cases. Got it. So then we partnered up with those organizations, including like National Organization of Women and others. And then they used that as a tool to advocate for the causes that they cared about and use it as a rights tool. So I want to um, pause there because I think people always have great app ideas. And I'm always like, it's always a chicken or the egg. Like, yeah. How do you actually get people to not only subscribe, but use, right? And I think, it, you know, in the beginning, there's a lot of potential education that you might throw out there through whatever ads or other things that might be. But what you said is such a powerful thing. Using other people's audiences is such a big thing I advocate for especially when it's aligned to what you're actually yep. doing and what they are actually seeking as a solution. So when did you figure that out as part of your process? We released the app and we very quickly got our like first 10,000 downloads in a couple months. And we're like, wow, this is amazing. Wait, wait, wait. How did you do that? Let's like, because that's a big milestone in yeah. itself, right? So how, what was your initial go to market? Word of mouth and a lot of social media mm -hmm. and just like literally just talking, pick up the phone, talking to our organizations and then showing up at their meetings and saying like, can we have 15 minutes just to talk about what we're doing and hear about like how we can help. So we always approach it with like giving instead of saying like, Hey, we want people to download this app. And we hit that milestone uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we had one of our co-founders is a pretty well-known civil rights attorney, Justin Moore. So he had a built-in audience as well. So that first 10,000, I don't want to say it was effortless, but it came like, in a way that led us to believe like, oh, this is, we're going to hit the 100,000 soon mm -hmm. until it didn't. Until it didn't. <laughs> There's always the spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. So every channel has its limit and you have to know when that channel hits its limit and always be planning to be agile in your approach. Uh, so yeah, we hit that. And then we started talking to organizations. We're like, hey, we came out a month ago. We talked about this. What's going to help us to engage with your users? Yeah. And then that's when we kind of had the light bulb go off. Well, a couple of things there. You use an influencer. Yep. And um, I'm assuming that influencer was super aligned with the work that, or the what this actual app was doing. 100%. Right? So he was advocating for you. And um, I had a meeting with Gary Vaynerchuk a, um, a couple of months ago, and we were talking about our Virgin AI, like my company. And I was like, you know, there's a lot of education that's needed in the AI space. And he said, you know, you need like a, an evangelist, somebody who will share like 
what's possible today, for instance, like, you know, and like that's sort of that influencer style. Right. So was he somebody that was speaking about your app and talking about it to his community all the time? Or how did that work? And it, how, how was he asked there, too? Yeah. So he was, and he we brought him on as a equity co-founder in the company. Interesting. In the, before we even launched. Okay. Because we were like, we know the lived experience. We know technology. But how about who is the person that's on the ground actually doing the work of justice? And without that, we felt like that was a big missing piece. Mm-hmm. So he's what I call like our first follower, right? And I think that's even more important than the leader. Like a leader without your first follower, you're not going to lead many people. So he was very public about it. He spoke about it, gave it both legitimacy and a voice and an audience. So uh, that was really important for the initial launch. Was he somebody you guys knew in your inner circle or did you have to reach out to him? And if you did, how did you do that? I ended up meeting him because we were... uh, both separately invited to a civil rights pilgrimage in Alabama and Atlanta through this organization called care.org. We happened to be sitting on the bus together. And what do you do? Oh, I'm a civil rights attorney. Really? This is what I do. And then we literally looked at each other and was like, you need to be a part of rights. And it's like, I need to work with you. Yeah. And that was kind of where the seed was planted. You know what? Um, I always say there are no coincidences. Like yeah. you're just supposed to meet people and it's like, the, the other thing that you said is like you went to this um, conference or whatever, right? And you building community in the areas that you're actually focused on, you're going to find partnerships, but you got to just be intentional and, and see like the bigger picture and the opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think like when you're going to network, if any founders are like building some one, being open about what you're building. Like I am completely against being super secretive. Like when you're ready to launch, just launch and talk about it. And be open to it. And second, when you approach people, be mindful of like what you're going to ask. Like before I even went on this event, I already had in my head like these are people that I want to engage with because it's useful for them. And this is how I can add value for them. Yeah. So that conversation wasn't just a ran- rambling randomness of like this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I am. Um... I talk a lot about enrolling your niche network. And what that means is just that it, it can't be a one-sided opportunity. You have to look at what's mutually beneficial on both sides to participate in a, a business together or an opportunity together. Or, you know, and, and once that clicks for people, it's like then it becomes like a real partnership. Yep. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it enhances both brands, right? It's not like you're just supporting one just because, or it's just because of the money or whatever it is. Like Exactly. You know, it's a win-win on both sides. It's a win-win. Um, 10,000 users. We're going to stick there for a second. I know you hit a, a little bit of a snag, and but I also get questions. I have questions around retention and our actual usage at yeah. that stage. So, and it sounded like you got 10,000 in your first month. Is that right? Within about two months. Okay. Yeah. So like, how do you know people were actually using it and using it in a way that they were going to continue to use it. Yeah. So one, you can look at just how many times the app is being opened and opened more than like 30 seconds and how many the session information that we all get access to. Okay. So we got that and we're figuring, okay, about 10% of the audience, we're using it once a week mm. for more than 30 seconds. Uh, but obviously that's not enough to really understand. So it's a lot of reaching out and uh, having phone calls with people or meeting one-on-one and talking. I, wow. I don't like surveys. Like, that's what I see. Like, yeah. the conversations are important. Uh, conversations are super important, but I also know for investors, and I, we haven't gone down yeah. that route yet, they like to see traction, and then they have a lot of specific traction yes. numbers. So let's talk about this snag, and then have you guys raised through this process, and sort of what's the end game with this uh, with this app? Yeah, we, en- we ended up raising in total probably about 300000 Not bad. Uh, 60,000 of it through like 80 investors through crowdfunding on WeFunder, uh, some through a VC and some through like angel investors. So uh, it was a mix, mm-hmm. uh, got us funding enough where we could kind of build it out and touch grow it. Traction is a big part of like us being able to prove that we can do that. Uh, we were fundraising to experiment to figure out the traction. Can you explain that concept to me? Because I know you do a lot of that at Unstuck. So experimenting to, yeah, let's yeah. let's go into that a little deeper. So I think like one thing we realized, just tying this into like getting investment, is two, we need to find, be very upfront with our investors on what this was and what, what it wasn't. Right. So this wasn't a traditional startup where it's like, we have a product, we know how to monetize it day one, we're going to build it. And this is how you're going to get your return. It was, 
there's a very big problem that's very expensive to solve. And if you find out how to solve it, it's very lucrative. Mm-hmm. To find that out, we need X amount of time and money to do it. Which uh, is the experiment. Which is the experiment of figuring out how to scale, which is like, do we go through partners? At one point, we did a marketplace for lawyers where they could sign up and like be on the platform as well. We like experimented with different models while trying to figure out what would work. Got it. Yeah. And what did work? The partnerships worked. Uh, but we reached a point, and this ties into this new stealth uh, yeah. company. We reached a point where we figured out, we built a very useful tool. The organizations were very excited to use, and people found useful, uh, but was difficult to monetize. Mm-hmm. And then we asked ourselves, why is it difficult to monetize? And so justice has a pro- math equation problem. And the way I like to think of it is, it's interesting. <laughs> if you think about how injustice happens, it can happen at any location in very little time to anyone, right? Anything could be like, oh, someone got wrongfully evicted from an apartment, right? That could be a decision landlord made in like an hour, went, locked the door, and it happened. Now, how do you see Not in justice? New York City. You'd be in that apartment for a year before well, you get kicked <laughs> out. That's just the truth. Yes, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or like a traffic stop pulled oh, over. I, I'm, just, this, but I'm not right. taking away from your thesis. No, no, I no. just I used to live in New York for a long time. I so. know. And rent control is, is <laughs> yeah, real. It's crazy. Uh, so <laughs> that injustice happens. Then now for you to seek justice. Yes. Can't happen anywhere. Mm. Happens in a specific place. You need to go to court or go to like a entity. You need money and you need time. So there will always inherently be an imbalance between how fast injustice happens and how fast justice can happen mm. no matter what yeah it's not even like you can't just throw it's almost money human at nature it. it's like part of the course unfortunately yes unfortunately right. yeah uh so we realized that we're like okay we built something useful but we need to like figure out like what can scale justice mm-hmm. and that light bulb went off a year ago when all the ai models started really being visible like they were public in the background but they weren't visible and they were like, hmm, now there's something that can help balance this equation. Yes. Because now you can scale it without depending on like, I just need to hire more people. The same people can do more. And even without the people, there's more that can be done. So I have a couple questions because you're giving me an alley because you know I talk a lot about AI and <laughs> just this is power and what it's going yeah. to allow businesses to do, right? And um, really change the way business models are done. And, and I'm looking forward to having that part of the conversation. I guess the one question I do have with rights is, have you ever thought about a strategic exit with a large nonprofit around this where they can use it as a tool uh, to continue to kind of build on their mission? Because it feels like you have all the right pieces, right, for some larger organization to potentially take over. Mm -hmm. And it's not like a a normal exit with a corporate or something, but in my mind, this is a because there's a lot of people, when I, and the reason I ask is like, there are a lot of people who have these big altruistic goals, right? And a lot of things happen to all of us, like, and there's a lot of baggage. Yep. And, and it's, in, a, in a way, adversity is what helps build any strong entrepreneur, right? Because sure. you're focused on that. But I don't know. I mean, I just feel like there's more to that story. I don't know if you're bugging our offices or not, but <laughs> we were having this conversation literally last week about that. So it's something that's in our mind as we're transitioning to this new startup that we're working on is like, there's this, like you said, it's of value. Yes. It just needs to be in the right hands in the, in the right, right place. So that's something we're exploring. Uh, if you, if you know, uh, people that might fit that point us in the right direction. Yeah. But no, it's good. It, I, I'm a strategist at heart. Yeah. So I, for me, I'm always, I'm always thinking, and if I, have anybody's business on my mind, it's, you know, I'll be texting you some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, but, but that is where we want the chess piece to go next is like, yeah. let's let's find a strategic partner or strategic exit. Yeah, to take uh, that because it, it sounds like um, a phenomenal tool that really can help a lot of people move from injustice to justice. And, you know, maybe it's not their first go around. Maybe they leverage the tool because I, in my mind, the one thing I will share is like, that moment when things are happening, I feel like if you touch anything, a cop can get upset at you. Yeah. And so I almost feel like this is a potential tool to say, all right, I just went through something like this, or my friend did, or my parent, or somebody, right? Yep. What are my rights? And then allowing them to be uh, understanding, God forbid, it happens to them or, you know, somebody else going forward. So there's just something that I... Um, I almost look at, like, life insurance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and hear yeah, me out for a second. 
Um, I started my career for 13 years at Prudential Financial. Oh, wow. Okay. Right? And um, I was in five of their businesses, and one of the, the businesses was where I was supporting 2,500 financial planners, right? And my job was, how do you make them unique and different in the marketplace? And it was my first iter- understanding of, like, um, you know, the, the ability of storytelling and being unique in the market and how do you move a commodity to be, you know, somebody that stands out, mm-hmm. right? But in that, one of their product mixes was life insurance. And life insurance is one of those things, unless you are, you've uh, experienced it, you, you don't understand the power and the need. So when I was 23 years old, uh, my dad passed pretty tragically. I'm sorry to hear yeah. that. No, thank you. Thank you. But it's, he's one of the reasons I do what I do. Like he's a, he was a big community entrepreneur, you know, all of those things. And part of my world is kind of taking his legacy to the next level. But I, but, you know, and he had a small life insurance thing and it paid for a little bit of my wedding and a couple of things. But the whole point was I didn't, I would have never understood. And in something like this, that's like, there's like these out, like, you know, someone passing, you know, it's going to happen. Yeah. Right. But then you don't understand the impact to you or your circle until it does. And similar to what you guys have built, right? It's like, you know, we know it's the bit, one of the biggest issues of our country, at least I, I think in the world, but yeah. in our country. Um, and, it, you know, so it's just one of those things that it just got so me it thinking. it touches you. Yeah. You don't always are able to appreciate it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So um, there are a couple other core topics. Let's get into the stealth and then we'll get into unstuck. Sure. We're going to get into AI. So. Give me that understanding of, hey, this was good. And obviously we learned a lot. So you went through the spaghetti. And yep. how many years was that? Can you give the audience yeah, some so perspective? It, it started as an idea in late 2017. Okay. When it was an idea. And then the first prototype built 2018. And then the first funding we raised uh, was 2019. And how did you know when to, and quote unquote, give it up is not the right word, but make it a less of a priority to focus on something else? Uh, when this I, the math equation idea kind of popped into my head and I said, no ma- even if this is as successful it's going to be, it's always going to be a powerful resource until we figure out something that really disrupts how justice is scaled. Mm. And so I was like, okay, that's probably going to be something different. I love the word disrupt. Mm-hmm. My advisory company is called Disruptive CEO Advisory because <laughs> it just it just it has this uh, mm, powerful meaning, and I think a lot yep. of us as entrepreneurs want to be that disruptor, right, and change the way things are done in a better way, whatever that looks like Absolutely, for you. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So let's go to um, this new stealth and AI, right? Yep. So what was the initial impetus and whatever you can share? I know it's stealth, but I think you're sharing these days. Yeah, I don't I know. <laughs> I can, I, I can, the name of it is 51 AI. 51 AI. Let's okay. go. And so it's an AI-powered advocacy tool to help organizations scale justice. Okay. Now, what does uh, that mean? So, for example, let's say the work that you're doing, let's say you get people that are filing complaints about the abuse in prison. Mm-hmm. You may be able only to handle 10 a day. But using this AI tool, it's being built for like specific use cases. You should be able to do a thousand a day, right? So it's scaling your ability and you should get better responses and collect better data. So if you're sitting in front of a mayor, you're not saying, we heard that there's an issue with the, you know, abuse or misconduct. You're saying, hey, we have a thousand reports and this is what the data is telling you, which yeah. is missing right now. Okay. I, lots to unpack just in those couple sentences because... That's the power of artificial intelligence. And I'm going to look at the camera for this. (laughs) I have been on a sounding, sounding the alarm with entrepreneurs and founders and CEOs for uh, now it's like uh, over the last couple of years after I was able to advise an AI company um, that specialized in this concept of AI agents and this platform. But the power of what this technology is allowing people to do today, businesses to do today, not just, I know there's a lot of uncertainty just because there's an, a need for a lot more education, but just think about what Wilde just said. He said it was an opportunity to go from a handful of complaints and understand what they are and, you know, work through them to thousands because you're putting in artificial intelligence um, different uh, factors or different 
parts of AI within your software. So I just want you to like just think about that audience. But why don't you explain on your perspective, like what what AI is a big word. Yep. And I think that's what scares people. So what is it that you're actually using to help fulfill that? Uh, so there's a really important point like that you kind of touched on. When we were thinking about AI and we went into this project uh, and we brought in a partner that's another large not-for-profit organization, which we'll probably announce in a week or two uh, who, who they are. Thank you. And then we were using the word AI. I said, stop. Forget the word AI. AI is a tool, just like anything else. Web, AI. The most important thing is the use case and the desired outcome. Yes. Let's start with that. And then if AI is a good tool, then yes, we'll build an AI company around it. Right. If it's not, then we'll use some other technology. Mm -hmm. So the premise of it was there's all these, all I'm doing, like with this company is collecting all the use cases. I don't care about AI at this moment. And then designing an AI, and we're calling it like a large advocacy model. Sure. It's kind of what we're coining it. A little spin on words. Yep. I love it. <laughs> uh, and building this large advocacy model specifically for the use cases. So yeah. we're starting with the use case and working back on how we're going to build it. Uh, so as far as like the interface and how that's all going to deployed, it's dynamic. So some things might be like a closed interface where it's a single use. You go in, you push a button, you can file like a complaint, it's capturing it and generating yep. some action for you. Yeah. All the way up to like creating agents, right? Right. Uh, which is kind of later down the line for us, tasks that require like more action-driven things to do. And I know like your startup works a lot around that. So. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because with Virgin AI, that's um, our startup, um, we help companies go from AI curious to AI powered, right? And part of that process is I think just like Web3, AI has this like scariness to it yeah. and people don't understand it, as we mentioned, right? But a lot of people are, as they're creating products, kind of slapping a, a LLM, a large language model, a chat GPT against it and saying, hey, we're AI enabled. Yeah. And what we're saying is, wait, this, your, your, your solution, your potential outcome that you're trying to seek may not need all the bells and whistles, may not, there, and it goes much deeper, yeah. right? Some of it might be needed coding. Other things might, like, might just need integrations. And then we're going to use the most mm -hmm. optimal uses of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and others, depending if it's a, a data-driven opportunity, if it's personalization, if it's uh, intent recognition, all of them combined, who knows, right? And I think what you guys are doing, I mean, of course you are, because you also run on Stuck Labs and you understand entrepreneurship better than most, but you're doing it the right way, right? And I think that is always the hardest part for founders in this like new emerging tech cycle right. is like, oh, we have to use AI. We have to use it. They don't even know what it really yeah. means. And then it becomes like, well, we just have to enable, we have to use chat gpt <laughs> like yep. and it, you know versus understanding really what the foundations of artificial intelligence are and you know and it's hard and you're not as a ceo and a founder meant to know how to use it it's not your expertise yep, exactly. you know and i think and so in that vein how did you guys even get into ai and like what was your education like there yeah so fortunately like i said as a ceo i consider myself a decision and vision engine that means, I need, vision and vision. that means I need I like to that. surround myself with people smarter than me. <laughs> yes. Right? So to make those decisions. So yeah. uh, early on when we had this idea, we we're fortunate enough to be able to bring on Noel Russell, who yeah. is going to be our chief okay. AI officer uh, in 51 AI. Can you share who she is? I've been watching yeah. her, and then I saw that partnership, yeah. and I was like, congratulations. That's a, yes. big, that's a big get. Uh, so, so Noel Russell is one of, one, one of my favorite people. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I thought but, I was one of your favorite people. You are too. I have, there's, <laughs> there's room for more than one. Uh, but she's a pretty well-renowned voice uh, in the AI space. Yes. Even before that, she had started as part of the original Alexa voice team. Nice. Right? Uh, and so she's one of the few like females that have been in technology for a long time. And she's really what like attracts me the most to her work. She's always had this core of like creating things for good, mm -hmm. right? AI with a conscience, AI with a cause. Everything, AI right? for good. Yeah, so uh, she's phenomenal. She knows how to build these AI models and all the, you know, different uh, ways to structure it. 
So we're really excited on like what's going to happen uh, going forward. And she forward. works for one of the big, the big five, right? Yeah, she she works with Accenture. Yeah. She also she leads like their AI practice or something, right? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. The, the global AI practice. Yeah. She does uh, work with Microsoft directly as well, and a bunch of other companies. And she's constantly touring uh, the globe and the country, speaking as a evangel and voice on AI as well. So, so I'm going to throw it out there because it's one of my goals too, but I'm going to come at it from a business and AI perspective. Yep. She's, she's, she's phenomenal. Like I, I, I'm really, yeah, female, all of that, but like she just knows what she's talking about. A hundred percent. And that's the beauty. It's like, yep. she's a true expert, like, yeah. you know, and uh, that's a, again, a big get for you guys. Tell me why she was attracted to what you guys were doing. How did you build that relationship? We had met just pre-COVID. At the time, she was the head of technology, I think, at NPR. Okay. And she put together a technology council at NPR, invited people to attend. I was one of the people, I think there's like 15 or 16 of us that attended. Uh, we connected, unfortunately, shortly after that COVID happened. And there was never a meeting, too. But I'd kept the COVID. conversation yeah. going. Good. And so when we built rights, she was one of the people that I had reached out to, even before the AI, just as someone in the technology space. Uh, and was she of, an advisor to rights? She was, yes, okay. an advisor for us. And we had just been supporting each other's work back and forth. So it was a good culture fit, good work fit. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to ask if you surround yourself with good people. That's uh, it. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to ask, yep. you know? I think there's a lot of people who want to be involved in really cool projects. And especially once they know the founder or, you know, it's like, they, there was, um, we did a, uh, a event at the AI Expo for National Competitiveness last week where we had uh, a couple sessions on the, how do you build with AI? It was part of our DC Startup Week yeah. powered series. So you were there, I think, right? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, so um, the panel that I was moderating was around some disruptive uh, AI companies. Now I'll have you on too. And some of the things that we talk about, but one was the AI Grants.co, right? Mm -hmm. And um, David Luff Luffglass is his uh, name. He's one of the co-founders. And he has an incredible advisory team, like incredible. Um, and, you know, their, their AI company, basically, uh, they're solving for a large nonprofit pro problem of like, they can't get the grants, right? And I look at it as like uh, unstuck in a way, in a sense of like, they only go up to right now $50,000 in grants. And just because there are a lot of nuances in the ways that you sure. can pay out fees and things, eventually they're going to build off of that. But if you're a new nonprofit and you have a big vision, you don't have a lot of money and you're not, you know, you're fundraising, but you're not. But this process, basically, you put in the information, it helps create the proposal for you. I think 80 to 90 percent right. optimization. And then, you know, you go in, you edit it and all the things and then you submit it. And the way their business model currently works is if they get the funding, they get a percentage. If okay. they don't get the funding, it's there's no fee. based on success. And it's all AI driven. Wow. And it's an AI first business. But the whole point of me saying it, going back to your point, is he said, you know, I think they have um, the, one of the CTOs, think of Lockheed Martin and a bunch of other like very high end people from USAID. And he's like, all you got to do is ask. People want to help. Yes. Especially when you have a really good idea and you're an executor. And I think that's also a big thing. I had a, a mentor I respected once and he told me, People think of asking the wrong way hmm. because people think that they have a limited quality of quantity of asks. Like I have 10 asks and if I ask Seema for one thing, that's one of my asks. I'm going to run out soon. Yeah. So I better be careful not to ask. When in fact, he said asking is the best way to build a relationship because now you've given that person permission to ask you back for something. Mm -hmm. You're expanding the pool and possibilities of you helping each other. It's funny because it was. it's always been really hard for me to ask because in my world, for, I was advisory for years. And then with AI, it's like I'm always helping other people, yeah. advising other people. So it was, I mean, I've, I've taken a lot of mentor. I mean, I have a lot of mentors and coaches, but it was always hard. And so, no, I, I appreciate that reminder yeah, and it, I, that reframe. It, it, a lot of like, if you, a lot of people that have desire to give and yeah. help, it's like the giving part like comes natural, but then yeah. it's like, well, I don't want to take. Like, it's it's hard. It but, is uh, hard, but it's it, a mental shift. It is yeah. important one though. Yes, because especially when you have a big vision, you cannot do it by yourself. No, not at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, there's something on my vision board that it says like, uh, speaking to somebody who is like ten years old, elder than you will like it's just wiser. Like that moment will change everything, right? And it's just that they have more experience, and it doesn't have to be. It's not an age thing. 
but it's the concept of like one conversation, one insight can really help propel you in, in, a, in yep. a direction that hopefully that's where you want to go. Yeah. So where are you with this second, you know, a startup now? Are you guys super early or where are you? So it's, it's the early days. Okay. Uh, funding re- just recently, it was hitting the bank account and the team. Yeah, you got funding. From, Congratulations. Yeah, a little bit of funding. So uh, we're architecting. We're hoping in the next maybe 60 days to have like a first version that we can play with internally. Uh, Prototyping. And, yeah. Okay. And then, Do you guys create all your stuff internally? Like, as you have your own developers? I know through Unstuck, you guys do. Yeah. So it's the same thing, right? Yeah. So it'll be all uh, internal. Uh, there's some bits and pieces we're going to rely on uh, Noelle to bring in some of her team as well to help, like, building some of the more uh, sophisticated, complicated, stuff. complicated yeah. yeah. It's also important with the world of AI and what you're doing is just like what's proprietary in terms of your workflow or what can be unique. Um, when I was talking to David about that and that AI govs, because I was like, you know, the workflow, people can create that, right? Yep. But they have very unique partnerships, really high end with databases that yep. are proprietary, like USAID stuff and others. And so his mind is in the right place of like, how do we always make us have a competitive edge? So how are you doing that with this startup? For me, like having to just dived into it. And whenever I dive into a product, a project, I get obsessed. I've yep. been obsessed like and AI just in general as a technologist, yep. but also as the project. Uh, so for me, more important than the work, protecting like our workflow, because I'm like, that's going to be really hard to just like box in and make it like, so people can't copy that. Correct. Is one, where are we getting our data and information from? Hence this partnership uh, with this non-for-profit organizations and others to come is really important because mm-hmm. that's data that's not publicly available. Yep. And then two is the use cases and go to market. Like, how are we getting people to actually use this in organizations? That's for me is the hard part to figure out. Like anyone can build and invent, but if we have those two built out, even if you can copy my workflow and what I'm doing, the other parts are going to be much more difficult for you. That's our moat. Yeah. Yeah, Kind of. So that's how we're thinking about like protecting the AI, like from being like copied or what we're building. And then what's your business model? How are you monetizing this one? Probably be a license uh, approach so organizations get a license from us and to be determined what that looks like. Sure. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. How long do you think from your experiences personally, and then we're going to now get into Unstuck and your your role there helping, I don't know, thousands of startups at this point, I'm sure. Like, you know, so like how long do you think it takes to like get to a little traction, like to get it out of the spaghetti phase, if you will? I think you should. The only thing you should focus on in the beginning is solving the problem and traction. Uh, that's come from like several startups where we're like we're in the build phase for so long, and I'm like, wait, we could use the whole time to find customers. Mm. So I think day one, let's say like today, you have an idea and you have a problem you want to solve. The very next question is like, who's going to use this, and how would I would get customers? And imagine you had a magic wand and it was built. This is your startup. It's now built. Okay, go ahead, go sell it, get users. What would you do? Yeah. And so I think within the first like six months of you working, if you can't find people that are excited about what you're working on, then either you're solving the wrong problem, talking to the wrong people, or have the wrong solution. So this shouldn't be like a three-year journey of like, oh, we didn't get traction. Like we've built stuff. So don't build Thor's hammer. Build something. Don't build Thor's hammer. Yeah. You know how the Thor's hammer, only Thor can use it? Yes. So if you don't talk to people, you're just building for you something that you can use. So You get excited. I've definitely worked with a lot of founders, a lot of developer, technical people too, who get obsessed with their solution. And it's not something like, is you know, and I'm like, the way you're positioning in the market is not selling. Yep. But they don't see it. They don't care in a lot of ways. And you know, we already know the statistics of numbers of like the early stage, 18 to 24 months, how many fail, eight, eight out of 10. But that for me, it's always that stickler of that five-year mark and the 10-year mark because 50% of those phases, businesses fail, yeah. you know, and that is a positioning problem, in my opinion, and obviously strategy and all. But it's like, if, if, you're, if you haven't figured it out by then in terms of gaining that traction, that's where you're, it's hard to, it's hard to stay the course even when you want to. And there's a distinction between traction and product market fit, mm-hmm. right? And product market fit is when you found traction that you could scale. So talk about that a little bit more. Go deeper yeah, into these yeah. concepts. So the first part of attraction is just, if 
finding a way that you can grow your users or your audience or the people on your platform. Yeah. So that just might be like, oh, I forgot a way. Every month I can get 20 people on my platform. Mm -hmm. Product market fit is when you can do that and you say, I'm not going to just take 20. I can go to 10 different markets and replicate those 20 that I got in, every day in this one market. Because I have people like, basically, when someone says, shut up and take my money, I'm like, product market fit. Yeah. There you go. Someone's like, sign me up with money, not with, here's my email. Yeah. Here's a letter of intent. With money, then it's like, okay, this is, you have product market fit. That's interesting. And is that more, do you see that more in the SaaS models? I see that, yes, definitely in the SaaS models. It's yeah. much more clear. Clear. Like yeah. we have uh, one startup uh, in our portfolio called Prize, P R Y Z E. And they had a client that said, not only do I want to sign with you, but can you charge me more because I want to make sure that. You all are around for the next five years. And wow. I see so much value in this. I'm like, that's product market fit. That is amazing. Like a client coming on that was a big client and saying that to you. That means they want this to exist in the world. They want whatever your solution is. Yeah. It's helping them. There's a big benefit. So let's transition then to Unstuck. Okay. Um, my understanding is this is like a pre-COVID idea or yeah. like it also started around the same time as rights or after kind of in tandem. Okay. With it. So I'm going to share what I believe it is, and then you can you, sure. can, you can make it more accurate. <laughs> so, because it is interesting, because I feel like that's when I met you is through Unstuck, like, yes. you know, and I look at that as like a startup studio. Um, you're helping, you know, a, I think a lot of people get stuck at that early stage yeah. idea generation. Like, who are, like, what is it that I actually want to build? I have a ton of ideas. And I believe you guys have a process to delineate that and support them and coach them, advise them through the process, Correct. Um, either through a live accelerator or virtual programming. Um, and then I think you help all build as well, some correct. prototypes and stuff, right? So what did I get wrong? So it's correct, but let me frame it. <laughs> Please. Within, within a second. The simplest way to understand it, it's two things. It's a software development agency and a startup studio. And when we first started, we were helping people build software. Hmm. But they kept telling us, wow, you've helped me so much with my startup. Then we discovered we were so good at what we were doing that we were doing much more than just building software. So I'm like, okay, fine. We have like this kick-ass software development agency. Yeah. But it brought us a lot of joy to see these startups like growing and going through the pain. So from there, we did 100 meetups over mm -hmm. two years. Every Tuesday. 100 meetups. Every Tuesday. You love doing meetups because they're always at your place. I watch it all in LinkedIn. We, we, <laughs> we do. It's kind of like how we got started. So yeah. we did like every Tuesday, I just did Unstuck Tuesdays, 10 a.m. to 1230 open house. So what does that mean? What would people do when they got there? So when they got there, there was only one rule. You had to come with one thing that you're stuck on. and then whoever, In your business. In their business, yeah. In yeah, their, in whatever, their business. Whatever they're working on. So okay. whether if they have a live business or not, they would come, for example, and might say like, I don't know how to get more customers or I don't know how to find a co-founder, whatever that was. So they had the problem statement ready. Yes. Okay. So they come with their problem statement and then us, whoever was there at the table, and usually it's our whole team, we'd say, okay, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes just talking to Seema about this problem. Yep. And we all round table, we talk it through. Yeah. And the core things at the end of it, there had to be a to-do. So we give them a to-do and we had these little cards called like action cards and we put on like, hey, to-do, you're going to interview 10 people and we're going to introduce you to DC Startup Week. Right. Right. Uh, and we're like, what's a due date? And we put a due date on it. And then our team follows up and bugs you until either you're like, please leave me alone. Or you're like, thank you. And you come back for more. Yeah. So that was our experiment. So in a way, it's masterminding. I've been yeah, through, I've, yes. you know, I've been in a lot of mastermind programs. That's a you're on the hot seat or I've done them in my programs. Right. It's like, all right, you have 15 minutes or maybe even less yeah. sometimes, or you have 20 minutes focused on you, which is amazing. And then you're getting perspectives from people around the table. Correct. Amazing. Yeah. And so the two things we wanted, one was to learn, and two, we're like, let's keep the atmosphere and the language we use, not like tech bro culture, for yeah. a lack of a better word. And so that people feel comfortable coming, because number one thing people said, we weren't asking for help because we felt like, it was over our head. It's sure. like very techni technical or you walk into a meetup and people are like, what's your ROI? What's your CAC? What's this? What's your tech stack? And they're like, whoa, what is I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we did that for two years. But they still had good ideas. It wasn't just because they didn't know the vernacular. They yes. still had a, a And they had the ability to learn. They just yeah. had to 
understand that it's just language. It's not. So it's always science. early stage brand newbies in entrepreneurs. We get, your we idea? get a mix. Sometimes it's startup rescue stage okay. that come in. Startup rescue. Uh, I like that. Yeah, so that's the, my repositioning stage. So you, you call it startup rescue. I like that. <laughs> what does that mean to you, actually? You've established, you've hit some growth and success, and you're stuck where you are. You either can't grow fast enough or the markets change and you don't know how to respond to it. Or you've changed as a founder and you're like just your startup is stagnant. So how do you monetize off of that? Like what's the model there? So we then through that we ended up running two startup accelerator programs and we did a unique thing. We're like either people are gonna say you're crazy, I don't want to do this, or they'll be like, okay, we'll do it. Right. So we said fine, you can come co-working space for 12 weeks. We have a structured program. You come sit with us and we're going to take you from where you are to be investment ready or launch ready or whatever product ready, depending on their goal. Mm -hmm. They paid an upfront commitment fee that could be refunded just to cover our costs. At the end of those 12 weeks, they had a choice. They could either say, thank you for the program. We're just going to walk away and continue. Or yeah. they could say, we want to continue and be part of the studio for the long term. That means us committing the next two years to give them specific service and advisory, and we would vest and earn anywhere between 6 to 8% equity in that startup for that. Do you guys at that point, after the 12 weeks, qualify? Because you're going to know, you know, because at yeah. the end of the day, it's about the person and the execution, you know, because the idea will change and pivot. So do you have that phase or anybody can say... It's it's mutual. So they have to choose us and we have to choose them. Okay. So someone might say, yes, I want you to be partners. But yeah. if we didn't see the traction or the viability or the founder fit wasn't like a fit for us, because a big part of it is like coachability is huge Got for it. us. And then willing to have like skin in the game. And probably in 50% of those startups that have been through, we ended up investing ca cash in them ourselves in addition to like helping them fundraise. Oh, wow. So... Then in that sense, the potential monetization comes when and if exits happen? Correct. Our strategic. So yeah, how many yeah. people are in your portfolio? We have 12 startups in our portfolio. Huh. The very first one we worked with, uh, we exited in a, like a partner buyout Got for it. them. So that was our first quote unquote exit. Exit. Uh, and we have a couple that are growing. So what usually happens, they do that and they're like, yes, we'd love to stay with you. And we don't force them to use us for software development, but by virtue of our relationship, they end up being like, hey, right. I just raised 500000 Can you help us build our MVP? Oh, thank you. You built our MVP. And then they retain us right. as a tech team or we build out their whole tech team for them so they don't have to worry about hiring a CTO and doing all that. It's kind of like yeah. a Kiwi Tech's model in that way, right? Yeah. What they do discounted. It's a little different, but yeah. similar. But like, it, but it seems like they're getting the best and you guys are getting the best out of them and you're, they're getting the best out of you guys because Again, even with Virgin, we say we're business first, right? Yeah. And then you have a lot of that. You have both business and tech, right? Like, yeah. and, and that's such a, a huge benefit. So uh, you also have like your studio, you know, your actual physical location. Yes. So when did you get that? So we had a physical location when we first started at Spaces in Roslyn, which is another co-working space. Okay. And we, w we entered when they were first constructing that place. So then we ended up taking- Pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, so we ended up taking a full, almost a full half floor in their open area, and they let us convert it to a startup studio. And I have a video of us, it's a time lapse of a whole day, building the startup studio. So we had like big glass walls that we came and set up like this cube. Uh, yeah. So that was our first physical cool. space. Mm -hmm. COVID came and, you know, everything went virtual. And then in and May, you guys went virtual during that time? You pivoted to virtual? We went virtual. I rented out some WeWork offices just because I got stir crazy sitting at sure. home. Uh, but for the most part, all our programming and everything was virtual. Yeah. Uh, May 2012, uh, we moved into our new space, which is in Roslyn. And a part of that was supported through Arlington Economic Development, the building owners, which is American Real Estate Partners and Roslyn Bid. Amazing. So we were like, we want to find a space. And they helped us to find a space, move in. And uh, it's been a great first year there. Uh, it's only been a year. I feel like you do so much there. So that's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I, you know, so 12, I want to ask about Prize. You mentioned them. And I'm yeah. just curious, what, who, who are they? Just because you mentioned their product market fit. So I wanted to understand. Yeah. So one, there are resident entrepreneurs. So they're physically in Unstuck. So founders that come in, they coach and, and help them. 
but uh, Natalia Micheletti and Tim Hilton are the founders okay. of uh, Prize. And basically, they're a workplace productivity app. Mm. So in the simplest sense, you ever been to like a restaurant or uh, a place where there's customer service and they're on their phone? Yeah. And they're, and they're like, hello. Mm. And then as a manager, you're like, what can I do to force these employees to stop that behavior? So it uses positive psychology by rewarding them points every minute they're not on their phone. Mm. So they go to work, they clock in, every minute they're not on their phone, they get points. They do good customer service, the manager sees it, they click a button, they get extra points. Those points get really good prizes so they can get like AirPods, Xboxes, spa days, the day off work. They're incentivizing their job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yes. No, but it makes sense. It's gamifying yeah. their job in yeah. a way, right? Everybody but, likes to be valued in that way. <laughs> but it sounds funny. Like some, initially, some employers are like, you want me to pay for them to do their do, job? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you're already paying. Like most fast food restaurants have 300% turnover or 200% yeah. turnover like over the year. So is that the market? So the initial market, the product market fit. Yeah. Is a fast food restaurant. That makes so uh, much sense. And like, because they're not as vested in their job. Yep. So for them, they're like, this is a means to the potentially, like, you know, what I need right now, at least a stepping yeah. stone for most. Um, and so that's a, that like that because yeah. it's a very different than if it was a four seasons or a bigger, yeah. you know, because they're, you know, it's just a different culture, like, yeah. you know, but that cultural fit, I, I love it. Like when we knew they had product market fit, two incidences happened other than what I told you, like they said, pay us more. Yeah. One, they had a pizza chain. And they're like, we have 10 branches. This is our worst branch. It's very difficult for them to sell. They implemented their solution. Within four weeks, they were their number one. Wow. Because the employees were, were like cross-selling and they were responsive and saying, hey, do you want breadsticks with that? In a month, which was insane. That's insane. Yeah. What a use case. What a uh, case study, I mean. <laughs> uh, and then the, the second uh, time that happens, there was like, when it was, there was a period and it might still be that way where it was very difficult to hire. Mm. We're like fast food places, like, we'll give you a thousand dollars bonus. So, this one particular chain had to close some branches, dining room during the weekends because they only had enough for the drive through. The labor, yeah. So, like, look, we have a big weekend. Can we test this out? They tested it out that first week. They said, we're going to give points to whoever picks up shifts there. They got the full, fully staffed. Wow. Immediately. Wow. And so that for every employee, I mean, that's a couple of thousand dollars they'd lose when they're not. Is this a there. workforce development? Like it's a play within that, yeah. right? Like it's interesting because I always, um, I've learned over the years what people invest in, at least from the state and government too, right? They get excited or they want to support you as a startup. But like when you say this is going to bring more jobs or this is going to help with retention of yeah. jobs or, you know, like they, they, they lean in more. Like, yeah. you know, that's a big, that's a, that's a great segment to be yeah. in. And I, I think, like personally, why I think it's so successful is emotion. Yeah. Not because of like, it does all this fine, but emotionally as like the person using this, it doesn't feel like another policy is jammed down my throat. Yeah. It feels fun. There's a leaderboard. I can see like what everyone else is doing. Yeah. And the reward isn't like in a month, I might get a reward. or f Even if you don't have a good relationship with your manager, it's in your control, right? You're getting the reward. So whatever solution you're building, the emotion psychology of it is so important. I love that. I love that. So in this studio, how much are you talking about AI right now and with these with these 12 well, portfolio you companies? You see, I have this AI route. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, I also... I <laughs> what is that? Oh, well, you can't just put that up and right, down. Right, yeah, my can, audience. Like, yeah, what is that so people know? Uh, basically, it's like the chat GPT app, but as a piece of hardware. Uh, but you can just click the button, ask it a question. It'll answer. You can point it at stuff. It can describe it. What is it called? Uh, Rabbit R1. Rabbit R1. But there's lots of controversy whether it's useful or not. And ChatGPT might have killed it yesterday with their announcement. They're of, new. Yeah. Of it's but uh, but it's, it's a fun toy. But I am obsessed with all things AI. Yeah. I also have a Vision Pro that I wear and look like a dork around the office <laughs> just to learn about tech. But I think there's going to be two worlds. Not in like 10 years, just in the next 12 months. Yes. Did you? Okay, hold on. Not in 10 years, but in the next 12 months. Please continue. <laughs> There's going to be people that are AI literate. Yes. And people that choose not to be AI literate. And yeah. the ones that are AI literate, that gap is going to be noticeable. Yes. And it's going to be really bad for those that are not able to be AI literate. Even if you're in an industry that you think is like, I'm in plumbing. What? The, why do I care about Every AI. industry, every business, yep. every division will be impacted. It is, you're either 
thinking about AI right now and hopefully implementing and using and playing and over time thinking about things that are strategic and in your own business or your AI. This is bigger than the yep. advent of the internet, right? We know it. Yep. We've seen it. AI <laughs> is infrastructure technology. It's yeah. not a thing. It's like when they built roads or trains. Like if you didn't use those that infrastructure, you're left behind. It's infrastructure technology. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In every aspect of the word. I love that. I love yeah. that frame. So let me ask you, for founders that are in the spaghetti phase right now, what advice would you give them, while If you're in the spaghetti phase, Talk to human beings, people, and have whatever you're working on. I would say 90% of what you're stuck on can be solved if you're talking to either people, partners, but have conversations and be obsessed about the problem you're solving and then be purposeful. So what I mean by that is if you're going having conversations with people, like even if I'm in the back of Uber, yeah, I'll probably ask them like, hey, do you use AI? What have you used it for? What do you think of it? And then like I have notes on my phone i'll be like okay 30 year old male driver family of four says he's used it and actually he taught, taught, taught his grandmother how to use it for recipes yeah. mm -hmm. right and then i look for trends i'm just always constantly thinking about that so that's one part like the curiosity mm -hmm. uh and the other part is uh try to get over imposter syndrome everyone doesn't know anything and then you figure it out as you go most like myself included like Oh, yes, I'm an expert. You're always figuring stuff out on the go. So have that confidence. I love that. I love that. I would say every conversation is market insight. It's market yeah. research, right? And you don't have to like, it's funny because I feel like you and I probably could talk business all day long. Yep. <laughs> like, you know, it's one of those things that probably comes very naturally to us. But in that, just these like normal conversations, you pick up on insights. But as a founder, you need to really be thinking about what those insights mean for your yep. business, right? So. It's not just always about the focus groups and the surveys. Yeah. It's about real people. I love, yeah. that. I love and, that. And then the other part of it is just, it's okay to feel overwhelmed. It's okay to be tired. It's okay. Give yourself that grace that you don't feel like, oh, I'm failing because uh, everyone else I see is this like strong founder and they just power through it. Uh, that's all kind of BS. Like give yourself. So much BS. Yeah. That's the point of this podcast is to unveil what the reality yes. is, right? Exactly. Like we've all been there where we're like, oh my God, nothing is going to work. Or I'm not uh, getting paid or man, like, yep. is this really going to work? Is there a product market fit after years? It's all the things, yeah, you know, yeah. it's real stuff, real it, talk. It's not all like, oh, it just happened. Look, so successful. Yes, there are like, I can't pay the bills if I do this decision and I kind of have to do it. So, right. right. Uh, so is there anything else you'd be rather doing than what you're doing right now? No, mm -hmm. I, like, uh, do you know Ikigai? The Japanese concept. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ikigai, so yeah. Ikigai is like when you find like something you love, something the world needs, something you can get paid for, and something you're good at. Yes. This is my Ikigai. Like I wake up, I don't feel like it's work. I talk to my son about it. I talk to my wife about it, probably a little too much. <laughs> but I just enjoy it so much. So for me, I'm in my happy place. And as long as I can do this, I don't need to retire. I love uh, that. Listen, while it was so awesome to have you on the podcast. Likewise. What a incredible story you have, the startup journey, the Unstuck Labs and helping so many people. And, you know, if you don't follow while on LinkedIn, maybe tell them where to follow you. Yeah, you can follow me on LinkedIn, on Instagram. Uh, it's just uh, World's Mine with a Z. Uh, that's where mostly uh, I'm not on Twitter much, but LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn. Yeah, he provides a lot of great content and insights uh, for founders like every day almost. So Anyway, thank you so much for being on. Really appreciate it. And until next no, no. time. Thank you for providing this platform. And if you haven't been to DC Startup Week, go. You must go. Yes, so. let's go. Yeah. And please subscribe uh, to this actual podcast. If you find value in it, write some comments. It's really important for us to you know, be able to spread the word because I think content like this is really going to help a lot of founders make a big difference in the world. So yeah. thank you. Awesome. Hello, Growth Tribe. As an entrepreneur, I know time is currency, and I don't take it lightly that you listen in on today's episode of the From Spaghetti to Growth podcast. I hope it added value, and I'm truly honored to be part of your entrepreneurial journey. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and keep listening so you can uncover opportunities and strategies to turn your unique spaghetti into growth.